Good morning. Uh, the standard infrastructure as code conversation focuses on helping network and system engineers put their code in a format that can be stored in a repository and managed like software code. Today, I'm going to talk about extending that idea or model uh, to treat infrastructure as code as the same as you would treat service code or software code um, and to think about it in a software engineering fashion. Uh, while the ability to check code into a repo and centrally manage it is a useful evolution in how we manage systems and networks, it overlooks what I see as a benefit of infrastructure as code, which is you can start to think about infrastructure in the same way as you think about other code primitives, such as functions or methods or objects, all of these things can be combined together and infrastructure as code gives you a way to do that. So hi, I'm Chloe, and I'm currently an infrastructure engineer at HashiCorp, but I came to infrastructure as a software engineering experience site reliability engineer. Big mouthful. Uh, because of this, I developed a unique set of strategies to learn what my more operations practice peers and senior engineers already knew about infra management. It feels weird to say in the traditional world, but let's say in the way people traditionally think of engineering, operating the code software engineers write has been the domain of systems operators or sysops. With the advent of SRE, this has changed some, but too often SREs are just seen as sysops plus rather than embodying a new way of working. Infrastructure code is touted as a way to close that gap, but too often all anyone has to say about it is it lets you check code into a central repo to be managed. What I learned while learning about infrastructure as a beginning SRE was that Terraform as a tool let me think about infra in the same way I thought about code. While the ultimate output of Terraform is concrete infrastructure, one of the benefits it offers is the ability to logically group and use code to invoke that infrastructure. Terraform modules are an opportunity to introduce a layer of abstraction, and when done right, that layer of abstraction translates between an abstract view of the system and the concrete implementation of the infrastructure that makes it up. One of the places that abstract view is documented is in the architecture diagram. For that reason, throughout the rest of this talk, I will be referring to the information capped in an captured in an architecture diagram as an interface. I think of it that way because I think of interfaces in code as objects that inform conformity between concrete implementations and abstract needs. The architecture diagram is a documentation of that interface, which makes it great to use as a map while writing Terraform. All right, talking about codes and diagrams hypothetically is hard. Let's look at the HashiCorp Enterprise Architecture Diagram for the single cluster deployment of console. This is from the console deployment guide on learn.hashicorp. I chose this diagram as an example because it clearly documents each of the resources required to run console as a service. It describes the relationship between those resources and it documents the specific requirements or exp expectations those relationships have. To look at this as an interface, console requires some server resources, some client resources, communication between them on various ports, and communication with the outside world. Any system built that can meet these constraints should be able to run a console cluster. Using this diagram as a record of the interface to meet, we can use it as a guide for writing Terraform HCL. To do that, we'll be using Terraform modules. In Terraform, a module is a collection of resources that are used together, providing an atomic way to compose infrastructure in logical groupings. This makes it the perfect way to capture the needs and requirements of a service as it allows for a one-to-one -one mapping between services in production and infrastructure resources. The first step of creating a module from this diagram is making concrete decisions about what the implementations need to be. I prefer to do this on the diagram, usually by making a copy of the image I can mark up as I want. <clears throat> to help illustrate the technique, I am using a console installation on AWS. On this marked up version, the data center label has been replaced by region. I've indicated that the nodes in the console cluster will be EC2 instances in an auto scaling group for res resilience, <clears throat> which is the red outline. 
And I've sketched in additional disaster recovery snapshot store, which will be in S3. Since this version of the diagram didn't contain the disaster recovery infrastructure, I've added it by hand. In addition to the resources necessary for computing, creating a cluster in the AWS cloud <clears throat> also requires resources to represent the relationships between the various computers. When I first started managing infrastructure, I found it difficult to wrap my head around. <clears throat> it finally became clear to me when I went back to my object-oriented roots and reminded myself that everything is an object and an object is a resource. On this diagram, those are marked as well. The replication and gossip relationships with their listed ports, which will become security groups and rules and IAM policies. By the end of this stage of the module's design, every object on the diagram should have some sort of terraformable infrastructure resource type associated with it. From here, composing the module at its core is about writing code to describe the diagram. Oh, a little water break. To continue using this console diagram as an example, my next step is to create a very basic Terraform setup with whatever boilerplate my project requires. In this case, I have the three files required by Terraform, a readme and a license file. Once that's set up, I pull up my main TF and begin writing HCL. <coughs> Let me back up. I begin scaffolding in HCL. I start by working my way through the diagram and writing placeholder declarations for the Terraform resource blocks I'll need. For this console example, I'll block in the auto scaling group that will be the console cluster and declare it with the resource blocks for auto scaling group and auto scaling launch configuration. The declarations on these blocks, which to my mind always read like method signatures, take a third argument, the resource's name. The name input here is how Terraform will think of this object. And this is how we introduce the interfaces abstraction layer to our infrastructure code. Here you can see the declarations I sketched in for the console cluster. The name for each of these is console, as this is the logical unit that represents the services deployment. <coughs> I could also have named it console cluster, which would make it even more obvious that the auto scaling group itself is the cluster. Because Terraform is where the translation layer between abstract and concrete exists, it's important to make sure the naming aligns with how design documentation, such as the diagram, records the abstracts. Since the diagram and documentation for console refer to the servers as a cluster, I name the ASG with the word cluster normally. I'm highlighting that because it's easy to let code drift from the documentation over time as it is improved and changed. If it drifts too far, it can become confusing and erase the benefits of clarity provided by this method. I go through the entire diagram this way, sketching in the placeholder resource blocks I can identify before I start writing any of the actual configuration. Approaching it this way keeps auditing the list of resources created against the diagram straightforward as there's a clear mapping. Once the skeleton is laid out, I can begin filling in each of the declarations with arguments to configure the infrastructure I need. Since this talk is not long enough to compose an entire module and iterate it the way I normally would, I'm going to narrow down to just the auto scaling group and launch configuration. When I'm writing Terraform in practice, however, this stage tends to be less linear and a bit more iterative. Since an AWS auto scaling group requires a launch configuration, I'll start by filling in the arguments for launch configuration. This is the Terraform resource that holds the configuration of the individual compute instances that will make up the cluster. In the first pass of composition, I've either hard-coded values or left to-dos to come back and fill in for many of the arguments. Most of these values will be converted to variables or will be taken as attributes from other resources. This allows me to just keep moving forward on creating and validating the HCL while I draft. While creating this auto scaling group, many of the other resources I create are referred to in the arguments. For the launch configuration, this is the instance IAM profile and the security groups. Since I've already put in placeholders for them, I can use the attributes exported by the resource declarations to fill those arguments. 
When I need to validate I've correctly linked them, each of those relationships can be matched to a line on the diagram to be verified. In this case, the name of the resource is an exported attribute, and so I'm able to fill in these arguments by referring to the interface functions they fulfill, such as the AWS launch configuration console. <clears throat> Once I've finished the launch configuration, I can go through the auto scaling group in the same way. Again, using hard coded values, I will iterate away from later. Since I already have the auto scaling group finished, I can again create the linkage immediately with an exported attribute. Being able to link abstracts in this way means at the end of this stage of composing the module, I should be able to match each piece of this main.tf to something on my diagram. I can audit that via a Terraform plan. Once this is coded and validated, I've made the Terraform work, and now I can make it conform to best practices. In this case, that means removing values and to-dos and replacing them with inputs supplied by variables or exported attributes of other resources as appropriate. This is what supports straightforward modification of the Terraform code for infrastructure management, such as upgrades or changing service needs. The module code will only need to be changed if the interface changes in a way the module no longer meets. In the sample launch configuration here, the AMI ID, type of EC2 instance, the name my SSH key is looked up by, and whether the cluster should have a public IP address have been changed to variables. These represent values that might change over time, and so a code approach is to make them easy to edit by capturing them with those variables. Meanwhile, in the auto-scaling group itself, the health check type and capacity timeout remain hard-coded as they represent contracts with other portions of infrastructure that should not change with the service. A few values will also remain hard-coded because they are defaults that are required by AWS and should not change often, if ever. Once this is finished for all the resources and a valid Terraform plan runs that can be audited against the diagram if necessary, the module can be used. While in this structure, it requires each service to run Terraform discreetly during the services setup, but the configuration for the services needs can now be included in a repository and can be run repeated, repeatably. However, using a little help from Terraform, we can improve it a bit more. Converting the code to a reusable module offers ease around automation, importing into other Terraform files, and remixing. While I highly recommend the learn.hashicorp material on module creation, the console example I've been showing has this structure you see on the slide. There's a modules directory containing all the HCL, including variables, previously written, and a root level main.tf that imports the module and supplies inputs to the variables via the root level variables.tf file. This approach offers two benefits in my eyes. The first is that Terraform does what it does best around infrastructure management when modules are used like building blocks. And by making each service importable, the underlying network itself can be mapped as imports of services and the infrastructure required to connect them. It provides a method for a services infrastructure to be audited against a central record, as well as atomically. Changes to a services infrastructure handled by other engineers can be fed in as variables without even having to touch the services code. The other benefit is my favorite though. Leveraging automation around variables and command line input allows the supplying of input at runtime on the Terraform apply. Developing an automated job that allows values to be pulled from environment variables or configuration files means that once a Terraform module for a service is constructed, resource code only has to change when a breaking change to the interface occurs in service development or operation. In my opinion, this is the true power of an interface. Since there was a fair amount of material here in a relatively short time, I'll bring it back together now on the things I hope you've learned from this and will take away with you. Constructing Terraform modules to represent services offers a methodology for capturing the power of interfaces for managing infrastructure. By using this architecture diagram as a guiding framework, this methodology allows the management of infrastructure through human-friendly abstractions. 
In a microservice-based architecture, it also creates a human-friendly way to audit networks when needed. Architecture diagrams record an interface. Terraform allows you to write code to manage a concrete implementation to meet it. Everything on an architecture diagram can be represented with a Terraform resource. The name those resources use within Terraform should map to the name it uses on the diagram as closely as possible. Reusable modules are where Terraform really shines and they enable automation and friendly abstraction. I hope this talk offered you a new strategy for Terraform design and composition or sparked a new idea for a way to look at your services and their relationship to infrastructure. As I wrap up here today, I'd like to share a personal thought. One of my favorite things about the HashiCorp user community, from coworkers of mine to people I've met at Hugs to engineers I've nerded out with in the lobbies of unrelated conferences, is their enthusiasm for making technology accessible for as many people as possible. I wanted to share this talk today, not just to help people in the audience who might need a new way of looking at Terraform, but also the engineers out there who don't know how to cross the gap and talk about systems with service owners. Infrastructure engineering has a reputation for being opaque, complex, difficult, and sometimes even painful. It doesn't have to be though. One of the HashiCorp principles is that beauty works better and that beauty can take the form of clarity or straightforwardness that eliminates difficulty, misalignment, and friction. It's my deepest hope that you'll find beauty of that sort in the methodology I've shared with you today. Thank you HashiTalks Africa for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you all HashiCorp user community for listening. I'll be dropping into the chat for questions.